Maybe I should introduce myself here. Um, I'm Annie. I'm one of the curators um, for Boundless. Um, so I've had the pleasure to curate this session, should I? Um, ethical questions for screen storytellers. And um, I've got a whole bunch of wonderful people here with me today to help talk and unpack a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> um and continue the conversation because um yeah it's there's a if you if you've been living under a rock um a lot has been happening um and a lot continues to happen and i think for me personally why i've sort of wanted to bring up this session was around um collaboration um, and, um, yeah, sort of giving rise to, and spotlighting sort of concerns and whatnot. Um, but before we begin the session, um, I would like to acknowledge that, um, although we are, we join together virtually, we are all joining from unceded Indigenous lands. Uh, I encourage you to put into the chat what on what land you're tuning in from. I myself am joining in from the lands of the Daryl people and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay respects to the traditional owners, um, their elders, past and present, and I extend um, my acknowledgement of the lands to all audience members and also extend a warm acknowledgement to any mob in the audience today. And also very grateful to have Laurie on this panel as well. Um, yeah. So, should I? Ethical questions for story, screen storytellers. Um, also, another pointer is that um, content warning and self-care. Um, we understand that the very nature um, of this event can cause discomfort and... Um, that the dis yeah. the discussions will include um, people sharing uh, lived experiences which may have been um, traumatic. So we ask that uh, you practice self care and do what you need to do to stay safe. Uh, this may mean um, leaving the room for a little while um, or speaking to someone about what you might need. Um, if you need someone to support you, please make yourself known to any of the New South Wales uh, writing New South Wales staff. Um, and we'll see how we can best accommodate um, your needs. Um, so, yeah, um, I sort of would like to, yeah, should I sort of came about because I wanted to sort of take a pause and reflect of what has been happening in screen. I'm sort of inspired by uh, curator Maura Riley and her work in the art world sort of asking how can we get people to think about race, gender and sexuality um, and to understand that these are sort of pertinent concern, persistent concerns that requires action um, and so I wanted to it sort of feels like every week you hear something new um, like a new incident or something and so it I wanted to sort of highlight the session and sort of ground it in sort of screen um, practice because it's so collaborative um, and I think this is sort of a space where it has the opportunity to really sort of see the potential um, and the rewards from like community engagement and all that stuff. Um, you can tell by our panel that we have like Paula and Laurie and Pearl and Haja and so I would like to like time for each of them to introduce themselves um yeah Paula would you like to start off thanks Annie hello everyone and greetings from Walla Madigal land I'm on um, I'm seated Walla Madigal land and um, my respects to elders um past and present and Respects to all First Nations people across country and um, Laurie, I, we're blessed to share this panel with you. 
Um, my name's Paula Aboud and I've been around for way too long talking about ethics and storytelling, coming from a practice of community cultural development, um, working across communities, immigrant, refugee settler communities, but also my own practice as a writer. And the, the learnings I've had in um, um, engaging with white systems in screen and literature and theater across arts. So I hope to bring some of that knowledge and um, Annie and I will kind of um, be in conversation with the panelists. So Laurie, do you want to <laughs> go next? Sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having me. My name is Laurie. Um, I'm broadcasting to you from Awabko and Waramai country. Very blessed to be here in a place we now call Newcastle. Um, I sit at a particularly interesting intersection, both personally and professionally. Um, my mother is Irish and Aboriginal uh, with connections to the Northern uh, New South Wales, uh, Northern Rivers region and the Bundjalung Nation. Uh, and my father is Philippine X and comes from the Philippines uh, and was a migrant here in the late 80s. Um, where I sit uh, professionally is within Screen Australia's First Nations Department. So I'm a development and investment manager um, and have had the absolute privilege of working there for three and a half years. Um, prior to that, um, I did a whole bunch of different things, which was basically me trying to ram myself into the industry any which way. Um, I'm not one of those people who has any familial connections to the screen industry, although I'm blessed to come from a family of artists. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, I had to bang down lots of doors um, to get where I am, but I still feel incredibly privileged. Um, the year that I started at Screen Australia uh, was celebrating the 25th year of the Indigenous department existing within um, the screen, uh, the Australian screen sector. It actually predates Screen Australia by about 15 years. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later, but um, I feel really honoured um, to be where I am in the industry and for all the people who've paved the way for me to be here today. Um, and I suppose I'll pass the baton to Haja. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Haja. I am speaking today from Bulunaming on uh, the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation, um, also known as Marrickville. Um, I am a writer and actress and have been writing in all kinds of forms for five, six years now. Um, started when I was 17, I'm about 23 now. And um, I was also part of, um, I am currently part of a collective called Finishing School which is a um, collective of women from Western Sydney writing books initially was the initiative and now it's kind of become more of a general collective and I am one of the um, directors on there too. I also have had uh, some experience in the screen world of course. Um, I was on a show called Halal Girls as a writer and actress and I run a page online called the Iraqi Diaspora Creatives Network, through which I have produced a web series, an anthology web series, um, featuring Iraqis all over the world um, who, who just pitched little videos. And um, the page itself primarily highlights Iraqi creatives in the diaspora um, on a regular basis. And it's a lot of fun. I also interview creative Iraqis, which I'll be doing later tonight as well uh, on there. It's primarily run on Instagram. Um, and I'm also just really passionate about speaking about authentic storytelling. Uh, my background, of course, is Iraqi. Um, I was born and raised in Australia. Both my parents are Iraqi and have um, a history of um, really interesting, uh, intense history, as most Iraqis would have. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm really passionate about 
accurately telling stories of people from my homeland um, and just people of colour in Australia and diversity in Australia, telling the Australian story in a more broad way that's actually accurate. <laughs> I guess I'll jump in now. Thanks. Um, <laughs> hi, my name's Pearl. Um, coming to you from Gadigal land, unceded Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. Um, I was born on Wajak Noongar land in Perth, Western Australia. Uh, my parents are Chinese from Malaysia and immigrated in 1976. <laughs> um, so uh, what do I do? I'm, I'm a filmmaker, um, have done a range of things in the past, uh, acting, focused mainly nowadays on directing and so I am a senior lecturer in directing at um, AFTERS, Australian Film, Television and Radio School and I am also undertaking my PhD in creative practice at UNSW which we will talk a bit more about in a bit. I'll hand back to you Annie, thanks. Thanks, um, I love hearing all about um, everyone's practices and what they do. I think, yeah, I think we have such a um great range of people in this room discussing um i would also like to let the audience know that this com that this is a conversation um and it's also not a personal consultation um and but we do encourage questions and we'd like to encourage questions that reflect um the points um raised um by or reflected by our speakers today. So yeah, um, maybe we'll get into the first question. Um, so Laurie, uh, First Nations green pra practitioners have um, histories of activism around representation and telling stories. Uh, what's your sense of um, that history and where we are now? Um, it's such a long and incredible history now. It's so hard to surmise, but I, um, as I mentioned earlier, at a point I started at Screen Australia was when we were commemorating the 25 years of the Indigenous Department and I was able to go through that history in detail um, and really examine the different ways that the likes of Walt Saunders or Sally Riley, Erica Glynn, Penny Smolicombe, and as recently as Angela Bates, the way they have um, used the position uh, within Screen Australia to advance First Nations key creatives is just incredible. To say that it started with humble beginnings is a bit of an understatement. It started as Wall Saunders kind of big borrowing and stealing from different departments across AFC is my understanding. Um, and that's also not just, that's a very limited scope of First Nations film history as it is um, because we have institutions like Karma in the Northern Territory, which were, you know, um, headed up by the likes of Frida Glynn, um, who I also had the privilege of managing the uh, feature documentary into her life and the amazing work that she did in that region and the creatives that places like Karma have created are, you know, Rachel Perkins, Dina Curtis, like the top tier names today. Um, so there are absolutely wonderful lessons to be learned in terms of the pathway that Indigenous people have made. And I think there's a lot that other intersections can learn and borrow from, which is a, a huge blessing to be able um, to share. And something that I, I like to always recenter in my work that we're not here to fight over the scraps as folks from different intersections. Um, we're here to lift and elevate each other so that we no longer have to, you know, deal with scraps. Um, and I feel like this last year has really shown a lot of the fruits of the labor of the past now. Uh, almost 30 years um, of the First Nations Department and much longer for Karma as well. Um, and we're seeing shows like AMC's Fire Bite, like that to me is just so exciting. Um, and I'm managing huge TV shows that, 
you know, we would never have dreamed of. Um, and certainly in other intersections, I can imagine that's not being dreamed of or it is, but it's not being supported adequately. So I also look at the First Nations sector with the lens of my other intersections as well, acknowledging that although I'm First Nations, I sit on stolen land and I am a mixed race individual who has quite a proximity to privilege. So I uh, just want to use and strengthen everything so it's equitable across the board. Um, that is not to say that it's perfect in the First Nations sector either. Um, I think uh, broadly, we assume that there's so much support for First Nations um, as opposed to other intersections. And that might be true to some regard in the way that we have protocols that are specifically written um, by the likes of Dr. Terry Jenke. Um, but we also have so many problems that we're still facing. Um, and I like to look at things quite realistically. And it is true, we do still have a bit of a ways to go, um, but I am really excited to see that this movement is being pushed and that our voices are being elevated in international spheres. Um, so I feel really lucky, but I also know that the work hasn't stopped and I can't sit back and just enjoy what I have. Um, I have to fight for uh, the voices that aren't being heard right now and to ensure that future generations have that voice secured for them as well. I could talk about this all day, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, <laughs> but And I think, Laurie, as you were kind of going through that history, my sense of that history, um, you know, in, in, in a context of a colony, you know, settler colony, um, you know, the racial regimes of representation is the terrain that First Nations filmmakers and activists fought upon. And, you know, those rep representations are such a um, violent site, you know, in, in so many ways. There's so much violence in representation and there's the, the burden of representation and the limits and contradictions of representation. And I'm, interested maybe a second part to that question is what you're talking about came out of struggle and that struggle was really around protocols and ethics of practice what's your sense of that space um, today having had that history of contesting representation yeah it's ever evolving I think um, I think there are many different areas at play, we're still seeing our stories being told by people who are not from our community. Um, we're still seeing representations that are two-dimensional um, or offensive. Um, we're still seeing um, creatives not being adequately credited for their works um, or having their, their ideas misrepresented. Um, so it is still a struggle and a fight and something that I was reflecting on recently um, is this notion of written law um, as in L-A-W um, and the way that that can be interpreted and I think interpretation of protocols and guidelines or perhaps misinterpretation leaves so much room um, for harm um, and I'm leaning towards the idea of we need to embody the ethics and the L-O-R-E law um, as opposed to, you know, seeing what the little section next to the box says and going, hmm, this co-cultural consultant that we're getting to rewrite the script yeah that'll do like that's not what we're here for so as as many safeguards that we can put in there are as many ways around them so for me it's about moving beyond the written protocols and starting to as an industry embody the moral and ethics that we say we do 
it's it's people's actions that I'm going to believe. Um, the a quote that I constantly say to myself in my work is, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I will not see it. I will not believe it until I see it. Like I want to see it in the budget. I want to see the proof in the pudding. Put your money where your mouth is. Um, and how that relates to activism, I mean, I, I struggle a lot personally with the term activism because I get labeled an activist. I'm like, I'm not an activist. Um, I'm not on the front lines like so many other activists are. I'm just speaking my truth. Um, and so I, I struggle with that a little bit, but I, I just like to think we're filmmakers we're telling our story i'm not an activist because i'm speaking my experience um, i got into this industry to be a storyteller i got into this industry because i wanted to be a filmmaker so i sometimes find the 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 rhetoric around um indigenous people black people people of color queer people disabled people us inherently being activists when we're just doing we're just directors we're just writers we're just developers um so i find that notion really interesting we're doing it because we have no other choice yeah completely um i'd like to pass to paul now um i know that you've been doing like a, your phd um and you I'd, it'd be great to hear some of your research so far around like the representation of um, cowed and um, or diverse characters on screen and um, yeah, what you sort of make out of all of this. Yeah, thanks. I mean, first of all, Laurie, you said so many things that just spark so many things in my head. I, I love so many things you said. I'm going to go back and quote you and things. Um, and it kind of leads to, it's, it's interesting because I think um, I started the PhD like three years ago now, I'm about halfway through part-time, um, thinking I was going to look at intersectional characters um, and intersectional identities and um, intersectional stories in terms of, um, you know, different types of people meeting in the same story. Um, as all good research, it's completely morphed into something completely different, um, but in, in the same kind of zone. So now I'm looking at um, the experience of diversity workers in the Australian screen industry, um, using intersectionality as a framework and using a lot of Sarah Ahmed's work, um, her research in higher education, her book from 12 years ago on being included and her book that was released last month, Complaint. Um, and it's really fun taking her work on observations um, in the higher education sector of which I also work and applying them to um, the Australian screen industry. So Laurie, when you were talking about, um, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing, feeling uncomfortable as, as in, in your activist identity. Um, Sarah Ahmed talks about it as diversity workers and becoming an accidental diversity worker by nature of having an identity that just doesn't seem to fit the norms. And so her whole kind of methodology is speaking to, listening with a feminist ear to, um, uh, to diversity workers and by listening to their experiences, realizing where the systemic blocks are. Um, so that's what I'm doing with the PhD, um, applying her methodology. The creative practice part, um, which I'm actually starting next week, petrifying, um, is a fictional podcast of a very intersectional room. Um, there's 10 of us all together uh, and all of us have an intersectional identity and it's kind of saying we're a complaint collective. So the, the fictional podcast is as though, um, which is Ahmed's term, um, the fictional podcast is as though we're in a writer's room, a network has asked us to create a story that ticks all of the diversity boxes at once um, so that they can, you know, tick everything off. And so, um, you know, this fictional writer's room is a, is a gathering of intersectional people. We'll all play characters probably quite close to ourselves. And we all have the discussions which are what the heck, like the discussions that we have behind closed doors. So you'll get to be a sort of like a, a fly on the wall to experience these conversations that, that we have behind closed doors and to kind of show 
solidarity, support with different intersectional identities, and um, that we don't always agree because we are often seen as a monolith of, um, you know, diversity. It's over there. Um, so yeah, so I'm starting that first workshop this weekend and recording that podcast um, in December. Uh, and yeah, really looking forward to getting it out there because I, I, yeah, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Um, can I uh, just add in there with Pearl? Um, I, you made me think of um, Nancy Leong's work as well. In, um, she wrote an article <clears throat> called Racial Capitalism. And when I read that, uh, it just seemed to fit in the screen space so much in terms of a framework that we're entering, like the system we're all entering, you know, where the complaints start, I suppose. Um, Nancy, um, Leong, Professor Leong talks about racial capitalism as the process of deriving social and economic value from the racial identity of another person. And, you know, arguing it's a long-standing common and, and deeply problematic um, practice. And that's really where the diversity space is because of, you know, diversity is a commodity, um, you know, and literally, film is a really good case study of that where racial capitalism is really common um, because diversity has become a kind of tick, tick box, even intersectionality. I like the irony of the intersectional writing room is a tick box. You know, how exciting we can tick five boxes here. Um, but it's unsurprising that, you know, racial capitalism is, you know, the commodity of non-whiteness is exploited for its market value. Um, oh, am I still there? Did I disappear? No, so, there. Yeah, sorry, I, I swapped screens. So I guess the question is in terms of racial capitalism and um, that framework, you know, it, it's your sense of your research um, grounded in that kind of um, you know, because that's where ethics comes in, because from racial capitalism, harm comes if, if it's everything's commodified, not the care and community and being community accountable. So is, is that some think you've kind of found in your research in the in the multicultural space, I suppose? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um... You know, a lot of the talk about intersectionality because it's shifted over the years so much in terms of and it comes it you know it's grassroots in black feminism and in um in activism um and i think where we're at now is this kind of uh trying to make sure that the term intersectionality doesn't get neutralized and reduced in the same way that diversity and inclusion can be sometimes so diversity and inclusion can be seen as a way to kind of bring you in but keep the same structures whereas if you're looking at intersectionality and have a um, you know like I've had such a steep learning curve when I first heard intersectionality I thought I'm intersectional I'm a queer Asian woman woohoo and then researching it more was like oh my goodness the blinkers came off it's all about systems it's all about so much more than that. And the interesting thing about screen making is that we are culture makers. And so there's a real opportunity to use intersectional frameworks to, um, to think through our work and to shift culture. So that like, I love what Laurie, you were saying about us embodying um, law, because you know, some of what is spoken about by Ahmed is uh, holding up a policy, holding up that LAW to say, well, because this exists, it means that the behavior that you're talking about doesn't exist. Um, so yes, in terms of racial capital, I think there's, a, there's another whole element there of arguments of authenticity, arguments of all this language that we use and all this struggle that we're having of like, people of color, cold, BIPOC, like, and, 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 and this is a distraction. It's another way for us to, I mean, it's important, of course, because how do we frame this, you know, how we talk about it matters, but the arguing about it, I find really frustrating because I'm like, oh, we're, we're all on the same team, you know, um, and I think it's another way of almost, you know, the, the, to be blunt, the right would label us as the lefties eating ourselves, you know, uh, so, yeah, I don't know, I've gone on a tangent, but hopefully there's some answer in there. But I, I do think that's part of 
the ethics in, in this space because of the racial capitalism and the commodifying of racial identities and the competitive nature, the market kind of place. Um, you know, the value that racial identity has acquired within the industry, people perform identity and it's consigned to a narrow set of stories and strips, you know, scripts that actually have to meet with white approval. And it becomes harmful and violent, I think, in this space, um, in a competitive space. And that's part of um, building a practice, an, an ethical practice, but also a community that supports each other and um, calls out, I guess, the, the, the harm that is intra and inter. I think it's between and outside. So it's coming, I, th I think it's a really timely um, conversation because there's been so many, in the last 12 months, you know, I've monitored for 30 years this space and the last 12 months, the, the, the register, if we're gonna do a register, Pearl, I love that idea. The register is full of receipts and learnings and um, a space for us to talk about the affirming space and call out as well. I, I think that's important. But Annie, do you wanna um, go to Hajar because um, we might start talking about cultural safety in this space. That's a bit of what we've been doing in that space with information um, and cultural exchange. Yeah, so um, Haja, you developed a tool in response um, to some of your experiences and observations in the screen industry. Could you talk a little bit about um, that and the, complex and the complexities of identities that you're working around? Yeah, um, do we have the tool by any chance on yeah, here? Hang on, I'll just share it. Cool. So, um, yeah, so this, I created a flow chart that is primarily um, for online usage, but I did have a vision and it is currently in development to be used um, in the screen sector in Australia and hopefully beyond. Uh, and it came out of a uh, frustration of having to explain this, the cultural safety and the right protocols um, and way of telling a story. Uh, the, yeah, I guess the, the protocols of telling a story of mar where marginalized people are involved, um, like I said, I, I um, am Iraqi and when I started the Iraqi Diaspora Creatives Network last year, I um, was getting into all these discussions with Iraqi creatives all over the world about frustrations of our people's stories being very um, uh, dire and not told by well, not told at all. And when they are there by uh, veterans who invaded Iraq or, you know, had to fight, you know, I, I, I do have a little bit of sympathy towards some veterans, but um, it's more the system of the war, the American war machine that I'm critical of. And, but, but the veteran stories were always, if you even look up Iraqi stories, the first few pages of Google will be uh, American war, war veterans, Australian war veterans, something about Afghanistan as well, because those two wars were around about the same time. Um, also, yeah, like even just mentioning that you're Iraqi, uh, you know, as you introduce yourself, if people ask, the first thing people think about is the 2003 Iraq war or um, just war as a whole. And so we're talking a lot about that frustration and there had been a show that had come out in the UK that was supposedly from an Iraqi perspective called Baghdad Central. Um, some of you may know about it and that uh, actually didn't have any Iraqis apart from one person in the creative um, development of the show and that person actually came on quite late and it was also an adaptation of a book written by a white man um also written from the perspective of an Iraqi family um and there's a lot of sensitive content it did end up tapping into white savior tropes and uh Americans ended up being quite 
favorable in the story despite it like presenting itself as like critical of the war machine um so we decided to speak up about it and I wanted a tool because at that time it was also around about George, the George Floyd protests and there was a lot of tools online um, and graphics infographics that were becoming really popular which I actually really love um, of course they're like limited but I love the nature of them being so accessible and I wanted to create something like that to explain if uh, telling a story so the title is is the story you have in mind your story to tell um, and I created this and this has been developed quite a lot since uh, the beginning with Paula and Annie and Lorraine a few other people um, in a group that we're working on uh, a cultural safety are we allowed to talk about this <laughs> a cultural safety risk assessment um, for the screen industry in Australia and this is one of the tools so I, I think I'll is it okay do we have time for me to go through it okay so the start the first question does the story represent your lived experience um, if we go up to yes you have to, I believe that we should ask ourselves what our relationship is to that story and why do we want to tell the story because as as Laurie mentioned intention is the most important thing when you're telling a story like do you want to tell the story people tell stories for all kinds of reasons especially in the screen industry where there's a lot of celebrity there's a lot of things that come with it. it's quite a lot of baggage but then even if you answer no to the initial question I still think you need to I mean sorry so so both yes or no you need to ask yourself the same question so even though I am a Muslim Iraqi woman I still think there are stories that um, I'm not quite the right person to tell those stories um, so to, to ask them we edited developed this to make it a bit more um, covering everyone and not letting anyone squeeze through the gaps and then if we go further on are you accountable to the community I think the biggest part of this conversation is that is trying to get people outside of the community to understand why what like having one token person from the community is so dangerous and so harmful and that question to me is the key aspect of this whole thing and I'll use an example so on this project that we that I was telling you about the uh, Baghdad Central TV show there was one Iraqi woman that was an associate producer and before I did um, we did an open letter to the production company and the creators I actually reached out to her and we had a discussion and then um, once I uh, openly like outside of me and her privately talking said something about the show and talking to the director of the show who's a white woman from England um, she didn't feel comfortable with what I was saying to that director and the, the critiques that I was making and she got very upset um, being part of the project I guess she she felt protective of it and a lot of people within the group who are also Iraqi living in the UK creative saw that there was a huge communication breakdown and she was the only one that was holding that whole project on her shoulders and it really did sever the community quite a lot and her probably connection to and reputation within the Iraqi creative community so whereas all the other creatives in the of that show did not have that impact they were not the ones facing the community face to face um, and that's why I think we've all agreed on this panel. Paul did you want to say something? I, I think because I think um, that leads into that that kind of space as well ethics I mean that the theme of this session came literally from um, this wonderful flowchart but it was also replicated in my mind internationally after another um, incident in the UK writer space. Some of you may remember Kate Clanchy um, um, and three women of colour called out Kate Clanchy in the UK 
um, in terms of really unsafe um, writing um, against children, no less. Mm -hmm. And the three women of colour who called, so this is for me part of the ethics of this space, the three women of colour who called out um, Clanchy were um, abused, had to leave Twitter. Um, so, you know, there's this burden as well and, and culturally unsafe. So, you know, from prominent writers um, and then you get, so that question of should I, you know, is in some ways for me, it's, it's, it's a leading question, but I wouldn't even say should I. Um, you know, Professor Sunny Singh was one of the women who called out Kate Clancy and put up a series of questions that align with Haja's wonderful flow chart here. And the question I think that's really important is should you write this at all? And the second part of Professor Singh's question is, as with most ethical questions, the question is not can one, but should one? So in some ways, this is about ethical practice and representation and self-determination and critical autonomy and agency. But it's also, I, I, I really like your flowchart because of the community accountability for me is a really important aspect of this. And we saw that with the unusual suspects, what happened there. And if anyone has a chance to read um, um, Gloria, um, just Gloria read, Bernard, yeah, yeah, be yeah uh, yes, if you have, I think it was on Screen Hub, but it's a yeah. really brilliant. Really well written and explored, yeah. Yeah, really brilliant kind of response to should I? because it, it, it is holistic in its approach to community accountability, representation, ethics, and you know, asking questions like, um, what does it mean to tell an authentic Filipino story if the majority of creatives working on the show are not Filipino or indeed Filipino women? So I know Annie, you have, um, you know, it's, it's um, part of your experience that, that show, but, um, I guess it's two forty-three. Where do do you want to? Um, does any of do any of the panelists want to add anything? Because I think this really part of the discussion is um, focusing on the ethics of or the ethical dilemmas that some writers may have about writing the other, and then we'll open it up to questions, maybe. Um, I, I I have dilemmas all the time. Uh, but <laughs> that's that's just my vibe. Uh, but I, I I do find myself being asked to give an opinion on really complex, you know, makeups or you know how do we reverse engineer this to you know reverse engineer authenticity um, into this. Um, and I find there is no one size fits all. Um, and that's another reason why guidelines and protocols can be so limited because the human experience is so complex and we're only just finding the language to talk about certain identities um, that, you know, so much of this is still in its infancy, um, but I'm so glad we're talking about it. Um, but the other thing I, I wanted to add is that even for me as a First Nations person, I can't go and tell any Aboriginal story I want to. I couldn't and I shouldn't. Um, I come from a very specific place in terms of my connection to my cultures, which are plural. And so I have to honor those um, kind of equally and hold space for that. Um, but I'm very cautious about the areas I step into whether they be Aboriginal or any other intersection, even if I do belong to it broadly, I'm, I'm not going to go and speak someone else's story without the permission. I'm not going to do it without that person with me. Um, and I think the other thing I always really like to remind people is you can't just go and grab anyone. You can't just go, oh, I have a neighbor who's, you know, such and such and they said it was cool. You would not believe how many times I get that. Um, people need to have 
experience. And it's not to gatekeep. And this is where it gets complicated for someone like me, because I don't want to put people in positions where they're set up to fail. But I also don't want to take opportunities away from people. So I think there's a lot more nuance and detail than just ticking a box, I am this identity. Um, and there is a lot more detail than, oh, we really just need to shove this diverse person into this role. There needs to be support and care, consideration, interrogation into all of these elements and aspects. And it's not just for cultural safety, for the producers and whatnot listening, it is going to get you money um, because not to toot my own horn, but looking at the First Nations sector, like, come on, you know, like it's some of the best international content. So putting this first will make our industry fiscally better as well as a nicer place to be. Um, so that's all I'm going to spiel about. Um, Pearl, did you want to um, add anything in there? I just want to say in terms of the flow chart, I love that even if it's yes or no, you end up at the same spot. It's yes or no, you end up at the same spot because that's really how we should be thinking. Um, and the other thing that pops to mind is this notion of research because this kind of like, I'm a writer, I can write anything. I'm an actor, I can play anything like kind of thing is, okay, what research are you doing? What does that research include? Is the research looking back on other stuff that's been done that is also problematic and using that as a reference? Or is the research looking at, um, you know, at something through a lens that is outside of that research? And so you're not picking up on the nuances that are inside it. So I think often people are like, it's fine, I've researched it, but then how can that be problematic? I looked into this. Um, it's like, what kind of research? What's the quality of research that you're doing? Who are you talking to? How are you talking to them? Um, you know, the, the Indigenous notion of relational wealth, do you have a relationship with that so that it's not just asking someone, it's not transactional what you're trying to get out of them? And, and histories here of extractive colonialism where communities are mined for stories and there's a history of that. So that's, for me, the, you know, the framework or the ground upon which, you know, we sit, that um, being really conscious of that, Laurie, you made me think of that, you know, kind of argument around proximity that um, needs a lot of really critical kind of pushback against proximity. Because for me, over 30 years, I've heard the proximity argument, I'm close to, or, you know, I guess in this space, we're also talking about um, the right of people to tell stories, the right to equity, the right to have access to telling your own stories, driving your own stories, producing your own stories, and to not make them palatable for white audiences or for a market. I, you know, that's for me also a really important part of this conversation. Um, Haja, did you want to add anything before we throw open to um, any questions from our, our, partic um, our participating audience? Um, I think I've forgotten what the initial question was. <laughs> I mean, you, you started it with the flow chart, of course, and I, I think, you know, it's self-explanatory, but I guess it's come from a working group, just to give a background to everyone, a group of us um, convened by Information and Cultural Exchange and led by Barry Gamba, um, have formed an, um, a cultural safety risk assessment working group, and it's really in response to the harms our lived experience of institutions that um, um, are driven by markets and driven by white gatekeepers and, and not just white gatekeepers. So part of this is also anyone can reproduce identity harm in our own communities. And a lot of us have, have experiences of people of colour producing or replicating those colonial models. So that's why I, um, when um, Haji, you talked about it's for everyone. It's not just, you know, it's about power and it's about how we, um, you know, work ethically. So, yeah, I think we can just go straight to questions. I'm interested in seeing what people want to ask. 
I got there's one from um from Natasha. Um they say, hi all, thank you for sharing today. I have a question for the panel. I am an emerging diverse writer with um, Papua New Guinea heritage, also an afters master's screenwriting student. Hi, Pearl. Um, what do you feel are the most important human slash personal traits screen practitioners can bring into an ethical cultural collaboration? Would anyone like to start us off? I saw the question earlier and I did, I did ponder it. I, I mean, if I'm going to be like on the happy, positive side, I would probably say empathy um, is something that a lot of other people need to bring in terms of understanding the very complicated places we all come from and bring into you know, say a writer's room um, or something similar. Um, but as someone who can also be overly empathetic, um, <laughs> I think there also needs to be boundaries. Uh, I think boundaries are really important uh, and equal holding of boundaries in empathy. Don't give away too much, you know? Not unless it's your own thing. Anyone else? So, I find this to be a tough question, actually, because it's hard. Oh, can you guys hear me? Oh, um, it's hard without being too definitive on like, I think what I find a lot of people just in Australia tend and in the screen industry tend to just not know much about other cultures. And I find that really frustrating. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. So I just think we need to be open to like consuming things from that aren't just from the Anglosphere. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a trait, uh, but we do need to just be comfortable with that. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say right now. <laughs> I'll think about it more. I mean, that for me, that's around more than that. It's anti-racist practice, active anti-racist practice, being really aware of the history. You know, I suppose because, you know, there's histories of, um, especially in the screen industry where people feel they, you know, there's this sense that people can tell stories about historically excluded groups without having to demonstrate or show any accountability. So for me, it's a practice, probably more a practice than a, a personal trait, because I think the system is pretty rotten. And I, 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 that's why I think I always argue for the systemic, because no matter how good your intentions are, you can leave and the system's still pretty rotten. So I suppose it's, I would fight here to be an activist in this space, you know, in, in terms of how we undo and dismantle systems that harm. Um, I don't think, I think competitive um, cultures in the screen industry are toxic. Um, so, you're also working against that. You know. The trait model is really interesting, I think, because the way our bodies and our voices are read and heard is different depending on who is listening to it. And so trying to articulate what traits we should be exhibiting. Uh, sometimes I, I feel like, well, I'm, I'm, I feel myself, you know, fit, trying to fit into that box of what someone is expecting of me. Um, there's really interesting work about um, situated knowledge um, uh, and I, I can put an article in the chat about um, about something I've written recently but situated knowledge in terms of there's always a situation where you can decenter yourself because we can't know about everything um, like the article I wrote was in in relation to our students um, in film schools but and empowering them as situated knowledge uh, knowers and there's a thing called the, the marginally situated knowers and the dominant situated knowers and what's great is that there's research that says 
the marginally situated knowers are more well versed in being able to notice gaps um, and being able to tell stories that speak to the marginal and to the dominant because being marginal we're so practiced at dealing with the dominant whereas the dominant aren't practiced at dealing with the marginal so I don't know I kind of see that as not so much trait but it gives me confidence to sort of go, yeah, I'm telling stories from this position. I'm aware of this position. I know I don't know everything. I've made so many mistakes talking to people from cultures who I'm not across. Um, uh, yeah, that I, I think that that allows an openness, I guess, as a trait to the work. That's fair. Um, do we think we have time for one more question? before we wrap up or yeah um so Renee um asks um I can imagine how it might be scary for creators to share creative control with the communities they want to depict in their storytelling how do we want to go about reassuring them that for example it won't blow out their budgets or derail their objectives I think um there's a lot to unpack in terms of like, what do you mean by creators? Um, I think if you're talking about what was in the flowchart, um, I think the whole point is that you shouldn't have creative control over a story that isn't isn't within the scope of your um, world or lived experiences. Um, and I do think that is a really tricky thing that, you know, I, I'm still really trying to unpack in my own work and because there is going to be a limit, like you can still create fiction and where does like lived experience come into that? Like, are we allowed to come up with like fantasy? Of course you can write fantasy and sci-fi and all that. But when I think more when we're talking about cultural safety, it really um does relate more to realist narratives and depictions of uh lives that are typically had that have been marginalized um so before we even get to who gets creative control all of that other stuff needs to be asked um, Paula or anyone else did you have? And I think, Paja, that goes to the heart of equity. You know, part of this for me, that question, should I? I would say don't because equity tells me that people with lived experience, people of colour, First Nations, um, you know, immigrant settlers, refugee settlers, second generations, third generations do not have the same access and the same resources and the same spaces and the same visibility and the same kinds of freedoms, um, freedom of expression. So for me, it goes to the heart of equity that um, we want space, we will take space and we will not water down our stories. So for me, it's about fair and equity for me is about fairness as well. So I think that's part of that equation in that question um, that equity is a really important um, principle and practice and action. Um, just to add to that, I would say it's already been done. Um, there's, you know, uh, I'm going to say something controversial. Um, I think collaboration over consultation always, but there is still a place for consultation. That's my controversial line. Um, and that is really important in the First Nations sector because we're not a monolith and it, it, it becomes really specific in terms of who are the knowledge holders in our culture and in our communities. Um, and so we still need to reach out to people who aren't in the screen sector to verify, to double check, are we allowed to show this? Um, in the First Nations sector, it's often put in budgets that the community will have the script read to them. They'll be at the, 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 the table or someone will go out with the script to the community. Um, it will be put into the budget that they are able to see and review the cut before it goes out. So all of these mechanisms are already being put into place and actioned. Um, these are line items in your budget. 
Um, they are just as important as any other safety line, as any other crew role. Um, these are necessary required roles in a professional industry. Um, so I would just say ask what other people are doing. Um, speak to other creatives who um, are working or have worked uh, with, you know, very specific nuanced things and ask about their strategies. Um, there are some really interesting ones. I can't talk about them because technically it's IP, but I just, um, you know, th there are so many different ways you can go about consultation. People often ask me, what is consultation? How long should it take? How, how much should it cost? I'm like, how long is a piece of string? You know, it's like, what are you trying to do? How many different communities are you trying to represent? How many different details are you trying to show? It's all got to be put into place. But we do this for everything. We have to have an A to Z budget before we go into production. We, we have to have all of this mapped out. It's just part of the planning. It's just part of production. Yeah, completely. Um, I've I could talk about this all day. Um, I, I love listening to all of you and I it's it's been I've I think it's really wonderful to hear all of you in um in conversation. Um it's three o'clock. Um and I'll let you all get back to the rest of your day. Um no. again for <laughs> joining our conversation um and hearing um what we have to say about like ethics. This is it's literally just the start of or like we're just adding to like a conversation this is not like the final thing final chapter like the com conversation keeps going so yeah feel free to like find a way to continue the conversation and um sp yeah spread the word and amongst communities and stuff like that and find a way to think critically and reflex reflexively about your own practice and other people's works and stuff like that so yeah that's all I have to say about stuff but thank you again so much it, it's been a joy um having you all here to share space so thanks again <laughs>